All right, so I'm sicker than a dog, but I'm hopped up on medication because I got the virus. And if I can't get through a half an hour presentation while times are good and the medication is still flowing, then there's no way in hell I'm going to survive a global cataclysm. So let's just get right to it. What you're seeing behind me here is a procession through the streets of Washington, D.C., but one of hundreds, if not thousands, of protests that include hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people around the world. Protests that are growing in size every weekend, it seems. I've never before seen protests that are so widespread, so persistent, like week after week, and so large. I think this will go down as some of the largest protests in mankind's history, because this is on another level. Surprisingly, Aside some rare incidents of desecration of statues and monuments and some unfortunate incidents of hate crimes and uh, light skirmishes between crowds and cops and different groups, these are relatively peaceful protests overall compared to like the George Floyd burning down cities type ordeal. We haven't seen that yet, but you know that train is probably just running a little bit late. The way things are going... This is exactly what you would see in the run-up to World War III. You would see more and more widespread protests like this for all manner of reasons, be they economic, cultural, or geopolitical, and that's exactly what we're seeing, guys. Now, I'm going to try to get through this video. I'm telling you, I'm probably going to have a coughing fit or my nose is going to start to run like a little kindergarten kid, but we're going to try to get through this. Okay, so here's the overview of what we need to talk about. And there's something that nobody's talking about with respect to the war between Israel and Lebanon. And it's about supplies. It's about stockpiles, okay? So please stick with me because I want to share that piece with you. I had a bit of a eureka moment in my research last night. Now, since Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah, gave his speech the other day, the exchanges between Israelis and uh, the Hezbollah on the Lebanese front have increased uh, dramatically. In fact, uh, Lebanon has been utilizing larger missiles, longer range missiles with higher ordnance on military installations, radar installations, and military bases along the northern border. So the war there is heating up. It's just not coming all at once, okay? Uh, they're taking it slow, then fast, if you know what I'm saying. We also have a global travel advisory for Israelis. Now, this has been in place for some time for Americans, but now it's for Israelis, particularly those of the Jewish persuasion, as hate crimes apparently are on the rise around the world. No surprise there in light of all of the tensions and with all these protests and, of course, with uh, a lot of the incidents that are currently unfolding in the Gaza Strip, we'll say that not a lot of people are happy about. Unfortunately, however, uh, it takes the form of hate crimes, which never should be the outcome. We should never generalize and stereotype and discriminate people on the basis of whatever, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to give a speech on that. Let's just keep going here. F-16s are in Ukraine. F-16s finally arrived, apparently five, according to Rybar, <clears throat> who is a Russian source, fairly reputable. I don't think they have any reason to lie about this. F-16s, of course, are nuclear capable. They can carry tactical nuclear weapons from NATO, and this has been the concern of the Russians, particularly Sergei Lavrov, Russian foreign minister, said when this was first floated, the idea of bringing in F-16s is that bringing in a nuclear-capable platform is going to have its problems. Now, people will say all fighter jets can carry nuclear weapons, but not Soviet-era. Soviet-era fighter jets can't carry NATO nuclear weapons. They could probably re be retrofitted to do so, I would imagine, uh, as they have been retrofitted to send out uh, Storm Shadow and uh, Scalp missiles, I think that's what they're called. But uh, it's not so easy w with respect to the the uh, types of tactical nuclear weapons as far as i know anyways that nato uses so anyways they're in ukraine we're at that level of escalation now Zelensky has shut down any thoughts of 
peace talks. There is these rumors floating around in the Western media that the Ukrainians are being pressured into doing peace talks with the Russians. Well, Zelensky came out today and just shot that idea right down. He said there's no chance for peace talks, in spite of the fact that his head commander, Zeluzny, is saying that we might be seeing a bit of a stalemate here. Now, is this just the feint? Is this just them trying to uh, goad the Russians into putting all of their eggs into this basket so that they can attrit the Russians in and around the Advivka region where they're fighting right now? I guess we'll see. Time will tell us. U.S. Army is hiring 800 recruiters, not personnel, recruiters. Yes, indeed. If they cannot meet the, the quotas for new recruits, then they're likely going to have to do a draft, especially if they get themselves into some Middle Eastern quagmire, which it appears is going to happen because guess what? Mr. Anthony Blinken is off to Baghdad in spite of threats by Iranian-backed militias. These are direct threats just issued today that said, we are going to end Anthony Blinken's life if he comes to Baghdad. He's going there anyways. Are we going to see a Franz Ferdinand, you know, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, World War I? That was the shot heard around the world. Is that, is that what that's from? Shot heard around the world? Anyways, that's what apparently started World War I. Or one of the contributing factors anyways, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Are we going to see that? In the very least, we are seeing a ramping up of attacks on uh, American military bases across the Middle East, which very likely will lead to some sort of exchange at some point in time. Let's see what else we got to show you today. Just get something else in the background here. This is another protest happening on the border between, I think this is one is in Iraq. It's a tiki torch thing by the looks of things. Uh, probably not a good look in light of, uh, they're probably not too familiar with American culture. Anyways, Nasrallah is giving another speech on the 11th of November, I believe. So I look forward to all the cryptic esoteric trailers and Veiled messaging that is going to come out in the run-up to that. Hopefully it's a little bit more eventful than the last one. China has intercepted a Canadian helicopter with a flare. So this is the second incident in a day. There was another incident today, but it's one of many incidents that has occurred between the Canadian military and the Chinese military. Of course, this is near the Chinese border, so they have every right to be suspicious as to what this helicopter is doing sniffing around. Apparently it was sniffing around for submarines and the Canadians in our typical Karen form were going to be shocked by this, but what do you expect? You know, if there was a Chinese plane or helicopter sniffing around our borders, I'm sure we would do the same thing. Israel is completely surrounded with militia groups. There's been more uh, IRGC backed militias heading to Southern Lebanon as well as Syria. And the uh, United States likely going to do a nuclear test in Nevada soon. Now, I want to show you guys something. Uh, what do I want to show you? Okay, so this is important, okay? Understand that war is all about resources. Russia is in a unique situation. They have endless fuel. They have a very large population, 140 to 150 million people, depending on how you count it. They have an endless amount of food. They're one of the world's largest net exporters of food. Not only that, they have a lot of inputs that go into food. So we're talking about fertilizers, raw materials. They could potentially fight this war forever. And they have their own industrial manufacturing of weapons systems. They were a net exporter of weapons. Second largest exporter of weaponry uh, next to the United States. So they have all the things to fight a war forever into perpetuity. Ukraine also has that somewhat because they are supplied by NATO. Now, do Lebanon and Israel have what it takes to fight a major war? The answer is no, they do not. And this is probably part of the reason why Nasrallah was reluctant to declare all out war, even though I don't think it would be, I don't think he's dumb enough to actually declare all out war you know, this is something where you want to maintain the ambiguity because it makes no sense to declare war. Uh, the only reason why you would do that is once you have, once you do find yourself in a high intensity conflict, uh, then he will likely utilize these broadcasts in order to rally 
groups within the region because he's got so much power and so much sway that if he were to come out today and say, all right, everybody take up arms, we're doing this, not just in the Middle East, but around the world, uh, people would listen, okay? And uh, it would create worldwide chaos. And so this guy has that power. He's speaking really on behalf of the Iranian government. So um, this brings us to the question of, will war with Hamas harm Israel's food supply? Remember, Lebanon, most people don't realize, who is not entirely uh, synonymous with Hezbollah, is seeing 170% inflation this year. 170%. That is hyperinflation. That's well beyond hyperinflation. If we had that here, you know, it would be the end of the world. It would be Mad Max in most people's mind. So Lebanon has 170% inflation. Lebanese fuel, diesel, and wheat reserves can only last one month. So if they go to all-out war, where are they going to get all this stuff from? Yes, they have the Russians who are kind of uh, supplying them with air defense systems. They're seemingly supporting them in other ways. So sure, they have the Iranians who obviously have a lot of fuel at their disposal. There's no shortage of fuel there. Iranians, I believe, are net importers of food as well. They have a rather large population. So... Israel, in spite of the fact that they have a $500 billion GDP, which should make you question, why are we sending them so much money? No, we, you're not supposed to question that. Anyways, moving on to the next point. $500 billion GDP, but they're still net importers of food. Now, I'm not sure in terms of weapons uh, production, but I know they're net importers of food and fuel. So their strategic reserves wouldn't last that long. They wouldn't last a few weeks without shipments. Although I'm quite certain if the IDF, you know, knowing their history, you would think that they would have fairly sizable reserves of these types of things that maybe they keep off the books, but who knows? Apparently they don't. Now this article was released uh, just a couple days ago by Nir Goldstein of the Jerusalem Post. And they say most of the vegetables and some of the milk produced in Israel are farmed in land near the Gaza Strip, which was given the name, the nickname, Israel's Barn. Access to this is heavily restricted. So is this fighting in and around the Gaza Strip going to put a strain on Israel's food supply? That's one factor that's contributing. The rest of the Israeli food industry is also suffering from a tremendous lack of manpower because all of these reservists, these 300,000 reservists, which is a lot for a, a country of only 9 million people, okay? And a lot of those are Palestinians, as far as I know, or uh, people who might not be able to partake in the war. Like, you know, I'm, I think women are, are more, it's more of a co-ed role there, but I don't think they partake on the front lines. And you have your seniors and your kids, so how many people are actually able to be mobilized? But 300,000 is a huge chunk of the workforce taken out now to go fight a war. Okay, so that's going to have huge economic repercussions. We also have imports that are made by sea, and there are already increasing challenges in shipping. And this might be part of the reason why we're seeing the largest amassing of warships in and around Israel. So this is what we're looking at here. Okay, so this is Israel. You can't see it here, but there's a bunch of warships out here. Primarily, they're centered around Cyprus. That's where a lot of the NATO military equipment is coming in. And uh, so what they're looking at is shipping insurance rates skyrocketing as a result of uncertainties over whether or not Lebanon is going to start murking commercial vessels. Because that would be one attritional way of getting at the Israelis, knowing that a lot of their food either can only come in through this port here. I think there's a port down here. And then I think they have ports like in Haifa and uh, Tel Aviv, okay? Because they're not getting anything from Syria. They might get a little bit from Lebanon, but I mean, what's coming in from there? Iraq, maybe they're getting fuel in some ways or possibly Saudi Arabia. So there's not a lot of waves in. Like they're not a rump state. They, they have a warm water ports, but you have a lot of stuff potentially going on here which could lead to uh, shipping insurance. And it's possible that foreign ships will refuse to dock at Haifa and Ashdod ports and insurance prices will skyrocket. 
Now there's also no emergency reserves of high protein foods such as legumes and canned meat. All of these things that I'm talking about right now, the reason why I'm saying this is because this is gonna be, this is the stuff that's gonna cause a country not to want to go to all out war. You can't go to all out war if you don't have months and months, possibly years worth of these resources, just in case your supply lines are completely cut. 90% of beef and cattle feed is imported. So 90% of their beef, of their meat, is imported, 90% of cattle feed is imported. In the north, settlements near the border were recently evacuated. So that's up here, okay, right by the Golan Heights and Nazareth. So this is where a lot of the fighting is going on near Lebanon, as well as now you're having militia groups pile in here. So this is where a lot of the eggs and chicken uh, farming was done. Okay, so we're, we're starting to see the reasons as to why these countries are reluctant to go to all out war yet, they probably don't have the supply lines to sustain a long protracted war like they do in Europe right now. Hamas allegedly has tunnels that they put food, fuel, and medication in. Of course, they have hundreds of miles of tunnels. We know that, but apparently they're saying they have about four months worth of supplies. Now, why would you ever let on that that's how much you had? Are they um, exaggerating that or are they understating it? It's hard to say. But another thing that people should realize, Lebanon, okay, this is Lebanon right here. It's about that big. It's about yay big. It's about 26 times, I believe, the land mass as the Gaza Strip. Now, understand that Lebanon also has its own extensive network of tunnels that go all the way from Beirut, all the way to Jerusalem, several different tunnel systems, okay? 50 to 100 meters below the surface in some cases. So the idea that you're going to be able to defeat Hezbollah in a conflict uh, is just an asinine uh, suggestion. I just don't see that ever happening. Now, does Hezbollah want to turn up the heat too fast is the question because they know that all those U.S. warships are likely going to come to the aid of the Israelis and they could be blockaded. They, there could be an embargo put on Lebanon, okay? So maybe this is why they don't want to go to war yet. They're stockpiling food, 170% inflation. I mean, the shit's hitting the fan in every possible way there, all right? So this is why right now, there was another warning put out today by the State Department that Americas are, Americans are urged to leave Lebanon immediately. Officials with the U.S. Department of State are recommending that all Americans leave Lebanon while they still can. Cross-border fighting between Israel and Hezbollah is intensifying. So, we know that there's a war coming. Now, according to uh, Israel, they're saying that uh, they're discouraging Israelis from leaving the country. They're saying, don't travel anywhere in the world because it's not safe because of the whole hate crime thing. Then you got to ask yourself, hmm, I mean, you know, if, if you were going to be fighting a long war, you would need a lot of reserves for that war, wouldn't you? And this is the same thing we've seen in Ukraine. And I'll said it before and I'll say it again. They don't want people to leave because they might need to put you in boots and put a gun in your hand. That's probably the reason why. Then again, if it's your country and uh, you, know, you believe it's your country and you believe you have a right to be there, you probably should stay there and fight for it, right? But uh, yeah, who am I to say? Um, the army is now looking for 800 recruiters. Chaotically, apparently. It's not a smooth process. Apparently, you know, it's hard to find people. You know, people want to play video games and live in their parents' basement. Who would have thought? and just do TikToks and uh, get crypto rich and get flued out and all that stuff. Well, I think the good times are ending. And uh, what we're probably gonna find is if and when we do get to a more precarious unemployment rate, and it's really not even so much the employment rate, it's people might be employed, but are they making enough money? The military will probably first try to incentivize people as they have been for the past year by giving people signing bonuses but what's ultimately going to happen is they're going to do a military draft because they're going to have no choice. Understand, we might be facing a war on three. Well, not we might. We will be facing a war on three fronts. 
and that means that we are going to need a lot more soldiers. Uh, I think, you know, the Canadian military, I don't even understand how we haven't embarked on this already, considering that we're flying helicopters, we're sniffing for Chinese submarines in and around Chinese territory, we're having these close brush-ins. How is it possible that we're not having a massive surge in military recruitment attempts? Anyways, the military is suddenly scrambling. Why would they be doing that, you ask? Well, because they know they're about to get themselves into a big war and they need a lot more troops. That's pretty freaking obvious. I can tell you guys that uh, I'm going to be sharing some information with you in the coming days ahead that is very concerning because there's certain institutions that are stockpiling stuff that I got word of from an inside source that... <laughs> I really have to do some research on, but I'm going to save it for tomorrow. But it's, it's rather interesting. I guarantee you, you haven't heard this anywhere else. Turkey is pulling diplomats from Israel. Turkey recalled another envoy from Israel. And uh, Erdogan has written off Netanyahu, basically saying it's recalling the ambassador and breaking off contacts with Prime Minister Netanyahu in protest for the bloodshed in Gaza. Well, a lot of people are saying, hey, all you... Arab Muslim countries, you guys are all talking tough, but nobody's really doing anything to help out the Palestinians, right? So eventually, that you're going to have to do something, right? Otherwise, the populations who are currently protesting in the streets in all these countries, they're, they're going to become uh, disenchanted with their leaders who are claiming to represent the Palestinian cause. Like MBS and the Saudis have basically told the Palestinians to go F themselves. Um, and they even told the Yemenis that no, they're not going to allow their airspace to be used to target Israel. They're going to uh, allow American refueling planes to hover overhead while the Israelis bring in their F-35s and do bombing runs on Yemen, most likely, and possibly even Iran. So, you know, the, the Saudis have picked a side. I think they've read the crowd, and perhaps the crowd doesn't really care about the Palestinians. And... Uh, you know, this is one of those things. People need to realize that, yes, as, as terrible as what's happening is in, in the Gaza Strip in terms of the, the civilian casualties, uh, the fact is not a lot of countries, the, no country is going to really do anything for ethical purposes. It's always going to be about national security and the bottom line. It's just an unfortunate fact of life. And it's always going to be the, the common person who has to go out and protest if they feel as though intervention is warranted in some way, shape, or form. But anyways, so in terms of um, escalatory ladders, okay? So right now, we are seeing, we're going to talk about the F-16s in Russia, this new nuclear bomb that can kill 24 times the amount of people you know, I can't believe how many mainstream headlines are running with that. It's just a bullshit thing. Anyways, uh, let's talk about this. Because we got to talk about what is going on. Lebanon, Israel. Nose is starting to run. I don't know how much time I have left. Um, we got to talk about the escalatory ladder. Okay, so the escalatory ladder is as follows. First, if you're going to go to war with a country, you put sanctions on a country. Or you, put, uh, you send out diplomatic signals, you issue warnings, you make demands, etc. Okay, maybe this is kind of where China and the United States were a few years ago. Then you put economic sanctions, you impose tra trade restrictions, financial penalties, show of force, military maneuvers. This is kind of where we are with China right now, okay? Then you, uh, uh, sorry, the third is the show of force military maneuvers near an adversary's forces or territory without direct engagement. So that's what we're seeing right now with Canada and China, where they, you know, you have planes having those close brush-ins. Number four is limited tactical actions, okay? Small-scale military actions, such as skirmishes and targeted strikes to achieve specific objectives, that's what we're seeing right now in Lebanon and Israel. That's four out of an escalatory ladder of seven. What comes next? Well, that's five. That's widespread combat operations. So that's engaging in broader military operations, potentially leading to full-scale warfare. I would actually say this is where we now are with Lebanon and Israel because 
we always were at four with Hezbollah and uh, Israel, and that was limited tactical action, small-scale military actions. There was always cross-border fire between these two countries, but now we're seeing what could be construed as widespread combat operations. Now, next is a war of attrition, a deliberate extension of conflict to wear down an opponent. This is definitely what we are seeing in Ukraine, okay? And next, last but not least perhaps, is total war. Mobilization of all national resources to destroy an opponent's ability to wage war without any limitations on targets or methods. We've yet to see total war in the theater of Ukraine and Russia because if we did, we would see nuclear weapons. We're seeing total war, however, in the Gaza Strip where they're pulling no punches when it comes to the bombardment of these uh, facilities where we're seeing civilian casualty rates, uh, the likes of which we haven't seen in many, many decades. Now, it's important to note that Israel is, for all intents and purposes, surrounded, okay? You have many adversarial countries. You have Jordan, which although it is considered a ally of the United States and Israel, is chock full of uh, Palestinians who've been ejected from the West Bank in various parts of uh, Palestine, okay? Or Israel, as they call it. Uh, the militant group Hezbollah launched missile strikes against Israel on Saturday using rockets dubbed the Volcano, as tensions continue to soar along the country's northern border with Lebanon. How are we doing for time here? Hundreds of thousands of Shiites surround Israel from Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq. At the same time, the pro-Iranian Shiite forces of the Axis of Resistance are building up their forces around Israel, both in Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq. The leader of the Iraqi organization, Al-Hashad Al-Shabi, Abu Fadek, announced a state of full combat readiness and support for Hezbollah in Lebanon. They have some serious firepower. It's estimated at about 170,000 fighters in Iraq and several thousand in southern Syria. That's in addition to the 100,000 that Hezbollah has and, of course, the 35,000 fighters of Hamas in uh, Gaza Strip. And who knows what's really happening in the West Bank right now. Hezbollah has the ability to launch ballistic missiles and kamikaze drones into Israel. Of course, they are uh, funded by Iran. And so we're looking at, uh, you know, the, the Israelis being surrounded by around 350,000 asymmetrical style fighters. And that's before Iran even directly gets involved with their own Military, So that is something to consider. Uh, the Islamic resistance in Iraq has just announced that next week they will be beginning a new phase in their operation to fight for the people in Palestine and in confronting enemies. They state that this phase will be much more severe and widespread against the bases of the United States in the region. So we're going to see a ramping up of attacks on U.S. military bases in the coming weeks ahead. And of course, they put a hit on Anthony Blinken. Get a load of this. Anthony Blinken will reportedly continue to visit Baghdad in spite of the fact uh, that threats were issued today by the Iranian-backed, uh, I cannot pronounce this, Kataib Hezbollah, who stated they would launch unprecedented escalations on U.S. assets in the country, including the American embassy and green zone in Baghdad if he decides to visit. So maybe maybe I read that wrong. Maybe that's not a direct threat on his life, but they are threatening to ramp up, and I'm assuming they would have to interpret it that way, right? Now, F-16s have arrived in Ukraine. This guy has something to say about this. This is uh, Rybar here. Let's see what he has to say here. I'll just let you guys uh, listen to this for a second. I'm not going to play the whole thing. Let me just see if I can. Because I'm about done here. Tonight, two F-16 fighter jets were delivered in trucks to the territory of Ukraine. In total, there are now five of them on the territory of Ukraine. 
Why were plans for the delivery of fighter jets accelerated? It's simple. After the operations of our air and space forces to destroy the military air potential of the AFU. First, the special operations forces practiced with the Lancet, then the A-50 in conjunction with the S-400. According to Zaluzhny's statement, the S-400 already reaches Dnipropetrovsk. And then... All right, I just got to take a quick break here. Blow my nose, I'll be right back. Wow. I think this is a first. Anyways, F-16s, is it a big nothing burger? Well, it all depends. Again, if they think that there's going to be nuclear potential with that, then, you know, it's, it's something. Um, of course, five F-16s is not going to turn the tide of the war, especially considering as the Russians claim they shot down 24 er er sorry, Ukrainian warplanes in the last week. But uh, apparently, the Russians are now going to be utilizing their Su-57s. That's their fifth, I think it's fifth or sixth. I think it's fifth generation fighter jet. It's kind of their equivalent of what a... Raptor or an F-35 would be on that level anyways. Apparently they have 20 uh, Su-57s and they're going to be utilizing those in conjunction with their A-50 flying radar planes to extend the range of their F Su-57s and that's going to allow them to uh, hunt down these F-16s. And they're also going to be acquiring another thousand S-400 anti-aircraft systems. Why would you need a thousand anti-aircraft systems? Uh, S-400 anti-aircraft systems. These are the long range. These are among the most advanced. The S-500 is the most advanced. They can take out satellites with those. Why would you need those while they're planning for these F-35s that are being deployed in and around Europe? in South Korea, in the Middle East, and they're all going to be potentially armed with this new nuclear bomb that can kill 300,000 in Moscow. Now, I got to talk about this because this is really starting to piss me off. Every single media website and even people who should know better are reposting like this as if it's something. The planned weapon could be 24 times more powerful than the ones used in Hiroshima. Really, 24 times. I think that's about 360 kilotons. Do these people realize that we've had 1.2 megaton nuclear weapons? In fact, the largest ever detonated was a 57 megaton. That was the Tsar Bomba. Easily in the, what would that be, like a thousand times more powerful than the Hiroshima explosion. So, I don't know why they're running with this because you know, people who don't know any better, it's a dramatic headline, 24 times bigger than Hiroshima. But they've had bombs like this for a long time. Uh, this will be new. I believe it's going to have, it's going to be more tuned for a ground burst. So I think they're specifically trying to, if I'm not mistaken, they're specifically trying to tune the bomb so that it's uh, capable of, of doing more devastation to bunkers, bunker complexes. And uh, I don't know all the details of it. These are gravity bombs. So there, there might be uh, a step up in terms of its guidance systems, but for the most part, they're dumb bombs as far as I know. So, but you know, I mean, this, these headlines like can kill 300,000 in Moscow. The United States has city killers that would kill 10 million people in Moscow, you know, like the 1.2, the Minuteman missiles, those have uh, multiple warheads on them now. So, yeah, I mean, this is, this is just ridiculous. I wish people would stop circulating this story, but it's a testament to how little people actually know about nuclear weapons. And uh, it's kind of sad. Uh, Taurus missiles, they're saying that integrating the German Taurus missile into the F-16s could take about a year. So it's, and it actually is that one of the, the things that's holding them back from uh, doing it is the ability to integrate it with the delivery platform, which is the Soviet era jets that Ukraine has had up until this point. They're saying that it's gonna take a few months, meaning that they've already effectively greenlit the 500 kilometer range Taurus missile. It's just that they haven't found a way to 
effectively deploy it on the battlefield just yet. And the Russians are claiming that the Americans are planning to do a nuclear test in Nevada soon. So, are we going to see it soon? Guys, i got to be brutally honest. The day quill is wearing off. So I think I gots to go. If you missed the video we did today, I did a video with my buddy Dean. Oh yeah, they're trying to attack the Kerch Bridge again. I'm not sure if you guys heard about that, but they tried and I think they failed as far as we know. Um, I did a video with my buddy Dean today. He, was, he sells the Arcopia freeze-dried smoothies. Last 25 years, one of a kind product, okay? And uh, the reason why we, I release videos like that on days when you know I just can't do these videos for whatever reason, get all kinds of cheeky comments about how it's like uh, infomercial and stuff like that. And it's, you know, I could easily come on here and do an audible pitch or do a League of Legends pitch every single video. The reason why I don't do that shit, the reason why I've turned down many TV shows, the reason why I turned down numerous invites from various guests is because I only want to bring you guys products that are specific to prepping. That is a very unique product. It is, it lasts 25 years, provides you all your micronutrients, you mix that with milk powder, you have yourself a Mad Max milkshake. It's like Soylent, but not made from people, okay? It's the perfect drink. So we try to bring you guys, uh, you know, innovative gear reviews like that, that you don't see in many other places. And Dean's a good guy, man. He's He's as prepper as it gets. Uh, we're going to be doing some hunting videos and all kinds of farm related videos. We've built some bunkies together. We've done all kinds of things. So a bunkie is like a small scale off grid house. So, you know, uh, just kind of take it easy in the comments on those videos. I mean, it doesn't really matter to me. Do what you want, but uh, you can view it as an infomercial. But just know that we turn down all kinds of offers on this channel. I got offered to be on a TV show recently and let me tell you, they were going to pay me a lot, but I decided not to for reasons that I'll, I'll probably save it for uh, its own dedicated video because um, it just wasn't my style, put it that way. And uh, you know, I, I, try to, I try to keep anything that I promote here. I only want to promote the stuff that I use. If I'm not going to use it, uh, why would I promote a video game if I think you're just wasting your life playing video games? Why would I promote League of Legends? Now, Audible, okay, you know, uh, what's the other one? So, some, there's some other services that are, I think one of the other ones is where you teach yourself stuff. It's like a self-schooling uh, program. But some of those things, okay, fine. You know, and I'm not like throwing shade. I know some channels have to do that. You know, we're in a position where we don't necessarily have to, you know, sell ourselves to those, to those companies. But anyways, uh, go check it out if you're interested. I think we're pretty much all sold out of the old stock. We had a clear out of the, the uh, older smoothies. And uh, now we're just bringing in the newer ones. But uh, go check it out. I'm just rambling on now. I got to get some rest because... I know there's going to be more news tomorrow. Thanks for watching, folks. Canadian Prepper out.